Hello, Mark here. Before we begin today's episode, I would just like to quickly take the time to ask all of those who are enjoying the series a favour. If the platform you use to listen to Castings for Ancient Greece has a rating or review system, I would be extremely grateful if you would consider leaving the series a quick review. These ratings and reviews go a long way into helping others discover the show, in turn helping it grow. So if you enjoy the series and can spare a few minutes, I would love to read what you have to say about your experiences with the show. Thanks everyone for your support, and let's get to today's episode. Themistocles, being now relieved of the fear which he had felt when among the Greeks, the man who had unexpectedly, on one hand, been driven into exile by those who had profited most by the benefits he had bestowed, had received benefits from those who had suffered the most grievously at his hands. Diodorus on Themistocles' exile into the Persian Empire. Hello, I'm Mark Selleck and welcome back to Casting Through Ancient Greece, Episode 55, Policies Evolve. We are now at a point where we can travel back to look at the political developments taking place back on the Greek mainland. We had first followed developments as they were taking place in the Aegean, building a picture of what was taking place in the wake of the victory over the Persian invasions. I decided to take this approach as I felt it would give us a much more flowing narrative of what was taking place. We first began looking at the rebuilding projects in Athens before then turning to the activities of the two Spartan royal figures. This saw us mainly focusing on Pausanias, his involvement in the dissatisfaction with the Hellenic League, and then his corruption and downfall. This period had seen the differences in the various members' interests come to the forefront. Athens, along with many of the newly recruited Eastern Greeks, wanted operations in the East to continue, while Sparta and the Peloponnesians wanted to bring operations back closer to their homelands. This then saw the Hellenic League at a crossroads, with Athens supported by the Eastern Greeks in a leadership role. Though in the next episode, we saw rather than the Hellenic League evolving into something different, a new league would be born. This is where we then focused on the birth of the Delian League, named after the island of Delos, where the first congress was held, and where the treasury would be initially located. The Delian League would be focused on maintaining Greek freedoms and protecting against future Persian aggression in the Eastern Aegean. But as we would see in the following episode, the activities of the Delian League would not only just be focused on the Persians, Thucydides uses the roughly next 10 years providing us a summary of the League's campaigns. This would also be to highlight his point of Athens' growth and power, seeing the League's behaviours evolve. This would then see the initial campaigns focused on the Persian garrisons, but future campaigns would switch to Greek targets. These would be justified through pragmatic reasons such as protecting against piracy, through to ensuring those benefiting from the League's operations were contributing to its upkeep. Finally though, the League would direct operations against members looking to leave. If this were allowed to take place, the League could easily dissolve. Thucydides would see a roughly 10 year period pass by where it would seem Persian activity had seen a decline in the region. However, the Persian Empire had not been standing by idle during these 10 years. To the Greeks it may have appeared their activities were absent in the Aegean, but deeper in the Empire, away from Greek eyes, business continued. This then saw us focus an episode on the hazy period of Persian history where small snippets of evidence pointed to possible campaigns deeper within the empire, as well as possible revolts. Though this period would also see major building projects commissioned by Xerxes. We then saw a build-up of Persian forces in southern Anatolia in what appeared to be the first aggressive manoeuvres against the Greeks since the 480 invasion. Though the Delian League would respond before the Persian force could be launched against Greek lands, this would end up seeing the first major clash between the Greeks and the Persians since the Battle of Mycale in 479 BC, and would take place at the mouth of the Eurymedon River. This would turn out to be yet another Persian disaster, and would effectively see further attempts at Greek lands halted. Having arrived at this point, I then saw this as being a perfect opportunity to head back looking over the same period, but on the events and developments within the Greek mainland. This would then give us a picture of the policies that were developing in the various city-states, and how it would affect their interactions. This will then see us develop a good understanding of how these would affect future relations and how future events would unfold. This will then bring us back to around the same period as the victory at the Eurymedon, and where the consequences of policies on the mainland and events in the Aegean would become more intertwined. First, let's look at the options open to both Athens and Sparta after 479 BC, and the paths different factions within them 
saw as their best way forward. As we will see, there were three main realistic options open to both, and I will be following along pretty closely to the options that the historian Donald Kagan outlines, as he does a great job simplifying them in an otherwise complicated period where sources are lacking. Though we will then try and explore these options with the events that would take place. The Persian invasions of the 490s, and more so 480, had been an event of marking a pivotal moment in Greek history. It had seen the Greek world begin to have to look further afield and take into consideration kingdoms and empires well outside the regional sphere they had been used to dealing in. These considerations and consequences of the Greco-Persian Wars would see that various Greek city-states, domestic and regional policies would also be impacted, which in turn would have an effect on the diplomatic relations with one another. We will be looking at this changing dynamic mainly through Athens and Sparta, since this is where our sources lay, though we will along the way see how other city-states would fit into this reshaping of the Greek world. After the campaign of 479 BC, we had seen that Sparta was at a point where it was deciding the direction of their policy after having defeated the Persian invasion. Initially the Persian threat had seen them in a campaign having to defend the Greek mainland and areas more directly connected to their own region. But even here, we found that the Spartans, along with the other Peloponnesians, were hesitant to head too far north out of the Peloponnese to mount a defence. They had put forward excuses to withdraw early on at most battles, wanting them to instead defend the line at the Corinthian Isthmus. We had seen that this in fact almost took place on the island of Salamis before the naval battle there was fought. We had then seen that it was only with the greatest difficulty that the largest combined Greek force would march north onto the Boeotian plains to fight and ultimately win the Battle of Plataea. If these areas had been too far out of Spartan territory and caused great debate, then it would appear something within Spartan politics had shifted, for they would then embark on a campaign well away from the Greek mainland and onto the Anatolian coast. What had changed is hard for us to know since we only have an outsider's view of Sparta. We don't get an account of the inner workings during these times. Though, like we have pointed out previously, it becomes clear that there were different factions within Spartan politics looking to influence policies. It would seem the opening of the 479 campaigning season was a period where a sudden change in policy had occurred. The accounts we get of Athens attempting to gain Spartan support come across like trying to draw blood from a stone. But then all of a sudden the Spartan army, along with the Peloponnesian allies, would march north. Coupled with this, they would then also embark on a naval campaign that would take them to the other side of the Aegean. Though once Plataea and Macale had been won, it seems like either the support for the change in policy began waning, or it had seemed to have served its purpose and circumstances had changed. With the defeat of Xerxes' invasion and what seemed to be the end of the Persian threat, Sparta now had to decide its best path forward, with the different factions attempting to influence this path. The last couple of years had seen Sparta at the head of the Hellenic League, leading operations on both land and sea. With the victory over Persia, they would then attempt to retain this position and seek hegemony over the other Greek city-states on land and sea. This option would see Spartan policy depart somewhat from tradition and how the Spartans had been governed. We have seen through Sparta's history that they had been hesitant to venture with their forces too far from the Peloponnese. This policy would see that they would need to maintain a sizable influence within the navy that would see it operating much further from home than they were used to. This policy would see the largest shift needed to take place in Sparta, since its society, culture and constitution were grounded in a more regional outlook. Though it's the faction that were in support of this path that may have seen the shift before Plataea occur. The next option that would have had supporters behind it was to take a more isolationist approach and see a dramatic scaling back of the past few years. Although this would have been a more popular path for the more conservative within Sparta, it would mean the past experience and changing events would need to be ignored while Sparta returned to their old domestic and regional affairs. This would almost certainly mean that Sparta would lose its status as the most powerful city-state. As we will see, the experiences of the Persian invasion had also seen more opportunities open up for other polis. Sparta was not just operating in a vacuum. Though the experience of the Persian invasions and the prestige Sparta gained from leading the Hellenic League would see that reverting back to their previous, more insular policy was not the most popular path forward after the victories of 479 BC. This would end up seeing Sparta following a policy set somewhat in the middle of these first two options we outlined. Sparta had never been a sea power and still lacked the seamanship 
to truly have any lasting influence over this domain. Plus, the rise in the Athenian navy had seen Sparta fall even further behind in this regard. We can perhaps see this policy starting to be enacted with a relatively docile response when Athens took on a leadership role around the whole Pausanias affair. Also, there is always the question around their concerns about their leaders becoming corrupted when far from home. We see this summed up by Thucydides around the period when he speaks of Sparta abandoning the leadership of the navy. The Spartans feared that when their officers went overseas, they would become corrupted, as I had seen happen in the case of Pausanias, and at the same time, they no longer wanted to be burdened with the war against Persia. But Sparta would not give up on expanding their influence within Greece itself. Here they would look to areas further afield than just the Peloponnese. Their influence on the Greek mainland had been where their reputation had lay before the Persian invasions, and now they look to continue to be seen as the most influential city on the Greek mainland. This approach would seem to dominate Spartan policy directly after the Persian Wars, where we would see a couple of examples where they looked to expand their influence on the mainland. As we saw a few episodes ago, the Spartan king Leotychidas led a campaign into Thessaly in the northern regions of Greece. As you might remember, Thessaly had Medes during the Persian invasions, which would provide the perfect pretext to begin spreading Spartan influence. The justification had been to bring those who fought against Greek freedom to justice. Though, unfortunately for Sparta, this campaign would come undone when it was realised that Leotychidas had accepted bribes from the Thessalian leaders he was supposed to be fighting. This would see him brought back to Sparta and face trial where he would go into exile in Tegea. Another example where Sparta looked to expand their influence was within the Amphictyonic League. This league had been created to protect important religious sanctuaries and punish those who committed crimes against them. Tradition had it that this league dated back to just after the Trojan War, where the Dorians of Sparta had been one of the original members. Sparta was now looking to have other members of this league excluded, such as Thessaly, Thebes and Argos, all who had sided with the Persians during the invasion. Again, this was taking advantage of the perception Sparta was fulfilling their role as protector of Greece, and punishing those who had failed to stand up to the Persian threat. Though by excluding these key members, Sparta would be in a position where they would be able to dominate a number of important religious organisations within Greece. Though Sparta's plans here would come undone, Athens was also a member and seems to have recognised the danger of these city-states being excluded, and it would be a speech given by Themistocles that would be seen to sway the direction away from Sparta having their way. As we will see, this would also see Themistocles become an enemy of Sparta, a man they had honoured in their city after Salamis only a couple of years earlier. But for now, in the wake of the Greek victory over the Persians, Sparta had decided to give up its hold on maintaining influence in the Aegean, and instead turned to attempting to spreading its influence further within Greece. This would see somewhat of a compromise between the traditional conservative approach while also recognising the changing world and the realities after the Persian invasion. Having seen the options before Sparta and the policy they would adopt, let's now turn to what lay before Athens. Athens had found itself in a position of not looking to maintain its position before the Persian invasions, but rather the invasions had increased Athenian power and influence, especially at sea. This had now seen them in a position with a number of options open to them moving forward. The Battle of Marathon had seen Athenian confidence increase with their victory almost single-handedly defeating the Persians on land, though it would be on the sea where their influence within the Greek world would truly grow. The shipbuilding program initiated by Themistocles and the subsequent victories at sea over the Persians during the Second Persian Invasion would not only highlight this to themselves but other Greek city-states that would have been well aware of their growing influence. So like Sparta, there were in theory three paths forward though only two were realistic given the political situation in Athens. Athens too could have gone back to following their pre-war policies, which saw them focus on more regional matters. This would have been the extremely conservative route to take, but with the opportunities created and the regions their influence now exerted into, there was no support that we hear of from any part of Athenian politics for this way forward. The remaining two options that lay before Athens would form the two opposing policies being competed over inside of Athens. The situation after the defeat of the Second Persian Invasion saw the one element that had held Spartan and Athenian cooperation together now gone. The mutual suspicion that had existed before the invasions would now begin to come back to the forefront, though with both being more suspicious of each other than ever before, given the increases in power and influence experienced. 
There had been differences of opinion that almost saw the league they had formed come to a breaking point, but the objective of defeating the Persian invasion had ultimately seen it hold together. Now though, they were entering the post-war world, where the objective had been met, but the suspicions remained. The successes of the Athenians on land and their dominance at sea had seen some within Athens encouraging an aggressive policy. They would have Athens look towards exerting their influence into all Greek lands. This, as you might imagine, would cause even further suspicion and ultimately conflict with Sparta, who were looking to spread their influence through various regions. We can see elements of this policy through the actions of Themistocles, who had now come back into the Athenian political limelight. He had been the mastermind of the growth of Athenian power at sea through his convincing arguments of how to spend the windfall generated at the Lorian mines in the 480s. Now he sought to continue this program as shipbuilding so Athens would still maintain the largest fleet of all the Greek cities. We had seen he had also supported the growth of the navy with their relocating of Athens port to the Piraeus. This he had reinforced with walls like the rest of Athens, this being in the face of Spartan opposition. Though it wasn't only Sparta who were concerned about this Athenian growth, as other polis had approached Sparta looking to prevent Athens constructing these walls. We can also see that Themistocles' attention was not just focused on the mainland, as after Salamis, he would direct operations that saw him exerting support and influence into the Aegean. We had been shown this by Herodotus, with his campaigns directed at Charistus, Paros, and Andros, with it even reported his policies had been felt as far east as Samos. This aggressive policy that Themistocles was pushing was hostile to Sparta and would see the two reach a point where conflict was unavoidable. He had held the respect and admiration of the Spartans just a couple of years earlier after Salamis, though with his pulling the wool over the Spartan eyes over the defensive works around Athens, one can't help see the beginnings of Spartan disdain for him. Though this wasn't the only policy that had support for it in Athens. Others would see that relations between Athens and Sparta could remain cordial enough for the time being. During the lead up to Xerxes' invasions of Greece, we had seen there had been debate over the best path forward with Themistocles' policy winning out. The tool of ostracism was a relatively new development and had been used to his advantage to remove his political rivals from Athenian politics. Both Aristides and Xanthippus had been within competing factions and had been attempting to remove him from politics. Though Themistocles outmaneuvered them both by forcing what would be described as referendums on the direction of Athenian politics. This would in effect see Athens' direction being voted on with the leader representing the opposing policy being ostracized. The 480s were a time of uncertainty within the face of the Persian threat. The policy of Themistocles would benefit the general population more with its focus on building an Athenian navy and promoting skilled labour. It perhaps appears that those attempting to counter him during this period had not united in a strong enough coalition, and Themistocles was able to pick them off one by one. With the emergency of the Persian invasions of 480, all previous political figures that had been ostracised were recalled to Athens, cutting short their ten-year exile from Attica. This had included both Aristides and Xanthippus. We get the impression from the sources that they all worked friendly enough during the crisis years of the invasion. Though with the victory of 479, we then begin to see the differing policies moving forward, bubbling to the surface. We have so far seen Themistocles attempting to push an aggressive policy spreading Athenian influence on the mainland and into the Aegean. But now there was another path forward that was also available, and this one would not antagonize Sparta. Aristides and Xanthippus learned from their experience dealing with Themistocles during the 480s, and this time, would not make the same mistake. They would form a coalition of sorts to counter Themistocles' policy, and this time they had another influential political figure in their camp, Chimon, who was relatively new to the Athenian political scene. The policy they looked to drive forward was one of increasing their influence throughout the Aegean now that they had become a major sea power. Their ambitions within the mainland were somewhat muted, giving room to manoeuvre politically between themselves and Sparta. Even though they were still looking to expand Athenian influence, their policy was far less aggressive and perhaps more focused in one area. Though as we will see, policies can change and evolve over time, with this path forward also eventually causing conflict. But for the time being, all three men would focus on putting into practice their vision for Athens as she moved forward, each one bringing their own strength to seeing it realised. For the time being, these three men had a common interest and a common opponent. 
a situation we have encountered before, but on the polis level. Although both competing policies were looking to expand Athenian influence and having Athens realise itself as a great sea power, there was one factor that would divide the camps, and this was Sparta. The coalition made up of Chimon, Aristides and Xanthippus saw that the best way in achieving their aims, and even potentially having Sparta recognise Athens' position in the Greek world, was to stay on amicable terms with them. This reducing the likelihood that conflict would break out between the two over their competing interests, or before they were ready for such a conflict at least. The paths forward for both Sparta and Athens were not immediately apparent after 479, though the unfolding events around both polis would see that policy would be settled on for the time being within the ten years after Plataea and Macale. There would be major developments in Athenian politics and on the Peloponnese that appear to be interconnected. These would be a major factor in working towards a policy that would be adopted for both city-states a decade after the defeat of Xerxes' invasion. These developments would be in the relations and manoeuvrings of a number of small regions within the Peloponnese, which would challenge Spartan ambitions and the stability of the Peloponnesian League. The other would be in Themistocles' policies being defeated, opening the way forward for a more moderate approach towards Sparta. This would eventually be done through the ostracism of Themistocles, though we need to be mindful that the details around both these developments are vague and lacking in areas, and like with the rest of this period, it isn't exactly clear the order of events unfolding. Have you been enjoying the series and thinking of helping support the show in some way? Casting Through Ancient Greece is over on Patreon, where we have been providing supporters with monthly bonus episodes, where we look at past topics in more detail and isolation. So far we have revisited the Bronze Age of Greece, looking at art, trade connections, warfare, and a number of other topics. We then advanced into the Archaic Period, where we spent some time exploring the little-known Latitine War, the Olympic Games, emergence of the Hoplite, and other areas. After this, we then turned to doing a three-part series on the epic poet Homer, covering both of his books, the Iliad and the Odyssey. We are now looking at the early history of both Sparta and Athens, where the latest bonus episode is focused on the mythical origins of the city-state of Sparta. We focus on the myth of the return of the Heraclidae, the story connecting the Dorian Spartans to the divine hero Heracles. Following this, we will next turn to the origins of Athens through its mythic past. If you are interested in gaining access to these bonus episodes, please consider heading over to the Casting Through Ancient Greece Patreon page. Not only will you get monthly bonus episodes, but you will receive early access, ad-free episodes, plus monthly video series updates about what has been happening in the series and what is planned. Other options also include access to fully referenced transcripts of the series episodes, as well as a forum where members' questions are answered every month via video. Alternatively, you can visit the Casting Through Ancient Greece website where you can find the Patreon link, as well as other ways to help support the series grow, when clicking on Support the Series button. Thank you all for listening to the series, and I look forward to perhaps seeing you over on Patreon. Let's first turn to the developments within the Peloponnese that would go some way into vindicating the more conservative approach of Sparta. This approach had wanted to dispense with exerting influence in the Aegean, and look to the Peloponnese and expanding into other regions of the mainland. As we have seen previous in the series, the Spartans had managed to put themselves at the head of what was called the Peloponnesian League. The members of this league were required to form an alliance with Sparta, but had no other responsibility to other members, unless they had personally worked something out between themselves. The formation of this league, and Spartan military successes after, had seen to it that Sparta would come to dominate influence within the Peloponnese. Though, as we will see, it appears that this security and stability they had established began to be threatened through the growing influence of some of the regions that were members of this league. There even appears that there were signs of some form of trouble with some of the members during Xerxes' invasion, while Sparta's greatest opponent, Argos, was recovering, presenting itself as a serious threat once again. When covering Sparta's early development, we saw how the polis of Argos had been the other powerful city-state competing for influence on the Peloponnese. It wouldn't be until 494 BC, after the battle between Sparta and Argos, at Sapia, that Sparta would emerge as dominant, and Argos fade into the background. However, even though we don't have any sort of detailed account of the history of Argos, they had not remained idle, and we know reforms would take place. Argos had suffered terribly at the Battle of Sapia, with a great proportion of their men being killed. This would see the attention of the polis look inward, 
looking to stabilise themselves after this disaster. As the Persian invasions developed, Argos would appear to be ruled by an oligarchy, and also looked to avoid membership in the Hellenic League. This had then seen accusations that Argos was sympathetic to the Persians, with Herodotus even reporting they were in contact with the Persians, extending assistance before the Battle of Plataea. Though we don't get reports of the same level of assistance that the city-states like Thessaly or Thebes would provide. Though how stable this oligarchy was is questionable, as after the Greco-Persian War, Argos would go through political reform seeing it adopt a democratic government. It is unclear when exactly democracy developed in Argos, though a number of modern scholars, Donald Kagan included, tend to see this occurring in the late 470s or early 460s, when Themistocles would be active in the region, which we will get to. This reform that was taking place would also see Argos begin to recover and would see them once again look to spread their influence into the neighbouring regions. This would become a worrying development for Sparta, as such polis as Messini and Tyrans, who had become members of the Peloponnesian League, sometime around Spartan victory at Sapia, had been brought under the influence of Argos. Eventually, the rest of the region of the Argolid would be united, with Argos in control. This would now see, after a few decades, the threat of Argos re-emerge to Sparta's east. Though this would not be the only region on the Peloponnese that would be of concern to Sparta. Towards the west coast of the Peloponnese was the polis of Elis and a number of other smaller city-states, including that of Olympia. The polis of Elis had been one of the original members of the Peloponnesian League when it was a relatively uninfluential power. Though the wider region, also known as Elis, where there were various smaller polis, began to go through developments that began to see the region become united. This would see that now, to Sparta's west, there was another region on the Peloponnese that was growing in power and spreading their influence into the bordering areas. This would eventually see their influence butt up against the region of Messenia, where Sparta's interests lay. The region also appears to have gone through certain democratic reforms that led to this unification, apparently with ambitious and aggressive figures leading the way. Elis still remained within the Peloponnesian League, but looked to other regions with similar political outlooks with their interstate relations, such as the Argives, and the Athenians. This development would have been somewhat alarming for Sparta, who were looking not only to maintain their influence on the Peloponnese, but looking to expand on it too. North of Sparta, yet another unification took place, and this time within Arcadia. The city-state of Mantinea would come about through the merging of a number of smaller settlements. Their establishment seems to be a fairly recent development, with it forming around 500 BC. Mantinea would also find themselves within the Peloponnesian League, though during this period after the Greco-Persian War, it appears yet another democratic faction was gaining influence within the Peloponnese. Again, it seems they returned to fellow democratic regions and cities for support. They remained as part of the Peloponnesian League, probably through necessity, but appears the democratic faction in control was far more hostile to Spartan influence. This seems to be a constant theme within these democracies forming on the Peloponnese and the connections to the political figure of Themistocles have been made due to his involvement within the Peloponnese and his aggressiveness towards Sparta, though we will look at this further when we look into his exile. We can perhaps start to see the developments in both Elis and Mantinea beginning to have an effect on how they viewed their relationship with Sparta during Xerxes' invasion of Greece. We hear through Herodotus that they would both arrive too late to participate in the Battle of Plataea in 479 BC. On the surface, this does seem strange, given that they were both members of the Peloponnesian League. Also, when Sparta had finally made the decision to march north that would result in the Battle of Plataea, many of the other Peloponnesians would join them. Though Herodotus says some did so only when they saw Sparta was on the move, and through feelings of shame if they stayed and did nothing. Being in the Peloponnesian League, and Sparta heading this league, one would think the members would have been the ones who joined this initial march. So perhaps this is where we can start to see the relationship with Sparta being questioned. It is probably not as simple as saying both Elis and Mantinea decided not to assist Sparta in the coming campaign. There appears to be factions within both polis debating their policy towards Sparta. This perhaps revealing itself where Herodotus clearly shows the representatives from both city-states distraught at their arriving too late at the Battle of Plataea and then punishing those responsible for this delay. This could indicate that opposing factions were debating policy as the campaign was unfolding, with finally the faction in favour of assisting winning out, though too late. 
those to be punished almost certainly coming from the opposing faction. Reading between the lines, it seems it would have been the democratic elements that were looking to oppose the march north to assist Sparta, given what we know of their views towards the Spartans. Though after some ten more years, it appears the democratic factions within these two city-states were far more influential and becoming a more concern for Sparta at this stage. As I have said, it appears the democratic elements forming and growing in influence have been associated with the activities of Themistocles. This would then see both Sparta and the opposing faction within Athens in seeing him removed from the Athenian political landscape. So let's now look to what would become the ostracism and eventual exile of Themistocles into the Persian Empire. The chronology of the events around Themistocles during this period are very difficult to pin down for certain. Though we do get a general idea of what unfolded, it's the details, when and in what order things took place that becomes problematic. Though through our sources, I'll try and put forward an account of what seems likely based off the events Sparta and Athens would respond to. It appears that Athens had made the first move in response to Themistocles, working to have his policy fade into the background. The coalition formed around Chimon, Aristides and Xanthippus had been strong enough to hold together and begin working against him. While this was taking place in Athens, it appears Sparta then found an opportunity to provide Themistocles' enemies in Athens with more ammunition. Around the same time that Sparta was dealing with Pausanias' corruption, accusations of treason were being levelled at Themistocles from some of his enemies. Sparta would then fan the flames of these charges by connecting him to Pausanias' actions. This is where things get a little hazy, as it is not clear if at this stage Themistocles was already ostracised, this caused him to be put up for ostracism, or, as Diodorus suggests, he was put on trial, cleared and had become more popular than ever. We can perhaps see during this time, Themistocles had been taking measures to counter his opponent's efforts in attempting to sideline him. In 476, and again in 472, he would fund the production of tragedies in Athens. It was common for influential political figures or wealthy nobles to become patrons of plays that would be performed. The performances Themistocles and his supporters would fund were the Phoenician women by Phrenicus and the Persians by Aeschylus. Both of these tragedies looked to the glory of Salamis and what was seen as Themistocles' greatest moment. He was looking to remind Athens of this period and his role in saving them. If what Diodorus reports is true, Themistocles' support of these plays may have gone some way into reviving his popularity, for a time anyway. If this was the case, it would have been alarming to those on the opposite side of politics in Athens. Again, if this was the reality of the situation, it then appears a much more serious campaign of discrediting Themistocles took place, outlining him as a threat to Athenian politics. This would have then seen the drastic action of ostracism take place. The policy of Themistocles, as we have seen, was aggressive towards Sparta, and we have good reason to believe that he was actively engaging with regions on the Peloponnese, some hostile to Sparta. We hear that when he would be ostracised, he would head to Argos, showing he had a relationship with them, while Thucydides also tells us he used to often travel about the Peloponnese. As we discussed, this period saw a number of regions on the Peloponnese begin to cause issues for Sparta, or they would in Sparta's eyes revolt from the Peloponnesian League in one way or another. It is in these rising democratic factions that we looked in at Argos, Elis and Mantinea that connections had been made with Themistocles' aggressive policy towards Sparta. We have been given a little more detail when it comes to his involvement in Argos. Though historians then look to join the dots with the vague comment Thucydides makes about him often travelling about the Peloponnese. Though one can see how taking advantage of the situation in these regions makes sense for someone hostile to the Spartans. I think we just need to ask ourselves to what extent was Themistocles' involvement? Did these democratic factions rise because of him, or did he take advantage of their existence within these regions and just look to support their growing influence? Sometimes we can fall into the trap of thinking many circumstances came about because of Athens, due to most of our sources coming from there. At the end of the day, they were not operating in a vacuum, and they would have been responding and taking advantage of the situations developing around them. It would seem that Themistocles had been ostracised by the close of the 470s if we follow along with Plutarch's and Diodorus' account. The coalition opposing him had managed to convince the majority that he had become a threat to Athenian politics. We also see evidence that appears to show pre-prepared ostraca 
were inscribed with Themistocles' name and handed out, as the examples that have been found show that they were all written by only a few different people, according to handwriting analysis. If you recall, an ostraca was a broken piece of pottery that was used like a voting slip, with the voter inscribing the name of the person that he wanted ostracised. This was presumably done to assist the many people who were illiterate. Though, as we all know, depending on how invested people are in an issue, people often like to take the path of least resistance. And Themistocles' enemies had made voting a breeze by handing out these pre-planned votes. Athens may now have rid themselves of Themistocles and his policy, allowing the Aegean to become the main point of focus for Athens for now. However, we hear he would still remain a thorn in the side of Sparta, and his actions still being brought to the attention within Athenian political circles. With Themistocles ostracised, he was required to leave the region of Attica for 10 years, where he could no longer take part and influence Athenian politics. Members of Athenian politics that were at a level where they found themselves at risk of ostracism were generally influential enough outside of Athens and had friendships with other factions or families in other city-states. Themistocles was no exception, and we have seen it appears he had held an elevated position with the democratic faction in Argos. It would be the polis of Argos he would travel to and begin to spend his exile, though our sources here suggest he would remain assisting Argos and these other regions of the Peloponnese with their pro-democratic reforms. For Sparta, this remained unacceptable, as it continued to work against their interests in the regions closest to them at the time they were looking to spread their power further in Greek lands. Sparta once again approached Athens with accusations that Themistocles had been complicit in the treasonous activities of Pausanias. Supposedly after Pausanias' death, new evidence had been discovered that the Spartans made sure was passed on. We are unsure what this information was, if it was true, and if the Athenians took the information itself seriously. The Spartans wanted Themistocles to face what was called a Congress of the Greeks, rather than be put on trial by his fellow Athenians. Themistocles, although ostracised, was still an Athenian and would be recalled to Athens, though it is unclear if it was these accusations that he was being called back to answer, or perhaps it could have had something to do with his continued activities in the Peloponnese. The charges of treason may have just provided the official reason. Whatever the case, Themistocles saw this recall was not going to be in his interests, and now decided to avoid having to answer whatever charges his opponents now wanted to lay at his feet. He now set out to seek refuge from those attempting to bring him to trial. He headed west and left the Peloponnese, heading across to the island of Corsaira, where they had an obligation of friendship towards him, due to the past assistance he had extended to the island in matters regarding Corinth. Though with Athens and Sparta wanting to see him brought to trial, there was only so long that this obligation would hold, with such powerful polis putting pressure on them. Themistocles next fled north to Epirus. Here too, he would only stay for a short period, with the threat of war being levelled at those harbouring the fugitive. This then saw somewhat of a surprising turn of events, with Themistocles finding safety within the Persian Empire, the enemy he had been so instrumental in defeating some ten years earlier. By the start of the 460s, the policies of both Athens and Sparta had now been mostly decided upon through the events and responses of the previous ten years. A large factor in seeing the tensions between the two city-states calm was due to removing Themistocles from the picture. He had not been brought to trial, but he was also now well out of the picture of both polis. He was no longer in a position to influence the political landscape in Athens, while his influence could no longer foment revolution amongst the Peloponnesians. Athens now found themselves in a position where they could focus on campaigning that revolved around the Delian League and the Aegean, where we have currently covered events up to the end of the Battle of the Eurymedon. Carmen had been leading the fleet over the years as he was continually being elected general. Between the campaigns that had been taking place, he would have been returning to Athens, where the focus would have been building support to see continued operations east, while also seeing that Themistocles' aggressive policy towards Sparta was being opposed. With Themistocles now removed from Athens and Chiron's popularity having steadily increased over the unfolding campaigns, he had become the leading political figure in Athens. The men he had formed a coalition with had been instrumental in the direction of the policy Chiron would lead, but they were now veterans of the system and would also disappear from the picture. Aristides had been instrumental in the early development of the Delian League, 
being the commander of the Hellenic League when it was decided to found it in the early 470s. It also appears he continued supporting the administrative functions of the League through the years. He had initially been in charge of the first congress and setting the tributes of the various members. It is also reported that Aristides may have died in the region of the Black Sea sometime after Themistocles being ostracised, and somewhere around the time of the Eurymedon campaign. It is thought he was looking to further growth of the Delian League, looking to include the Greek cities around the Black Sea, though it is also just as likely he was on a diplomatic mission to the region that was of the utmost importance to Athens' food supply. All we find in the sources is the sentence from Plutarch, leaving both these lines of thought an open question. He says, Some say Aristides died in Pontus, during a voyage upon the affairs of the public. Xanthippus also appeared to have been an important figure in seeing the direction of Athens' current policy take the course it did, though we don't hear much of his involvement in events after 479. We had commanded the Athenians during Macale and at the siege of Sestos. It appears he would die around the mid-470s, with him not seeing Themistocles ostracise, or the policy he supported as being the established path forward. Though Xanthippus had a son, who he met as a child during the evacuation of Athens in 480, before the Battle of Salamis. His name was Pericles, and he would also enter Athenian politics, where he would see Cimon's popularity come to an end. And he himself become one of the, if not the most influential political figure in Athenian history. Themistocles' departure from Greek affairs would also see the situation for Sparta on the Peloponnese stabilised somewhat. How influential he was in these matters is still open to debate, though it is hard not to see backing from one of the most powerful democratic city-states as not having some influence as the political developments in these regions of the Peloponnese unfolded. Into the 460s, we hear that Sparta would take measures to counter these democratic reforms spreading throughout the surrounding regions. The polis of Tegea, by the early 460s, had formed an alliance with the democratic-leaning Argos, which would have been concerning, since Tegea had been one of the largest Peloponnesian supporters to follow Sparta to Plataea in 479. Some have suggested that Themistocles may have had a role in seeing this alliance come about, but whatever the case, this was a development that the Spartans could not ignore. We hear through Herodotus that Sparta would march out and challenge the Tegean and Argive alliance on the field of battle. Herodotus gives no other details other than that Sparta was victorious, though interestingly, there are indications that there may have been other polis assisting the Tegeans. Fragments from the poet Simonides, who was a famous epitaph writer, are suggestive, with the title of one ode he composed called Celebration of the Hellenes and the Athenians who fought at Tegea. If this was the case, it shows that Themistocles had a good level of support for his policy. Though those who had fought must have been acting in a voluntary capacity, otherwise this would have been a case of open hostility between Sparta and Athens, something we see being avoided for now. This victory seems to have stabilised the situation for Sparta for the time being, seeing the greatest threat to their dominance on the Peloponnese eliminated. It has also been put forward by the historian Paul Ray that the contemporaries of the time recognised that had Sparta lost, it could have well meant the end of them as being a great power. So for the time being, both Athens and Sparta had a clear policy that saw they would not encroach on one another's interests. Athens was focused on spreading their influence throughout the Aegean, where they would amass a great wealth. Sparta would focus on their influence in the mainland, though events as they were saw that they were having to divert most of their attention to maintaining and re-establishing their influence throughout the Peloponnese. The Spartan army would see that their neighbours' territorial ambitions were brought to a halt. This roughly brings the situation on the mainland up to the events we had been covering in the Aegean. As we now move forward, we will see the events involving the Delian League more connected to what was happening on the mainland. This will see the developments within Athens and Sparta continue to evolve as they responded to these future events. And as we will see, Sparta was far from having to stop worrying about threats in the Peloponnese. Not only would the acts of man cause problems for them, but Mother Nature would shake them to their core. Next episode, we will head back to the Aegean, where we will see the continuing operations of the Delian League after the Eurymedon campaign and the unfolding political developments of these actions. Thank you everyone for your continued support and a big shout out to all those who have found some value in the series and have been supporting on Patreon and other various ways. Your contribution is truly helping me grow the series. 
I would like to give a few shout outs to some new supporters over on Patreon. So a big thank you to Christine Fowler, Gurkha and James for making the decision to sign up and support the series. I greatly appreciate it and hope you enjoy the extra episodes. If you have also found some value in the show and wish to support the series, you can head to www.castingthroughancientgreece.com and click on the support the series button where you can discover many ways to extend your support to helping the series grow. Be sure to stay connected and updated on what's happening in the series and join me over on Facebook or Instagram at Casting Through Ancient Greece or on Twitter at Casting Greece. And be sure to subscribe to the series over at the Casting Through Ancient Greece website. I hope you can join me next time when we continue the narrative in the series with episode 56, Thassos, The Path to Conflict.